mountain wildfire. It's now estimated at least 10 hectares and is 0% contained. Take a look at this. It's burning on the east side of Skaha Lake, south of Penticton, near Okanagan Falls. The regional district of Okanagan Similkameen has now issued an evacuation order for people living in 319 properties in an area known as Heritage Hills. Those properties run from the foot of the lake right up to the mountainside. Air takers, as you can see, are hitting the fire with retardant, and wildfire staff are on site as well. It's not yet clear what sparked this fire, but it has grown quickly. It has been a very hot day in the Okanagan, in at least the low to mid 30s. Again, a fire burning east of Skaha Lake, just south of Penticton, and this smoke is visible throughout the Okanagan, has prompted local officials to order th people living in 319 properties to clear out. They have to leave. They're asking evacuees to register at 199 Ellis Street in Penticton. Penticton's fire chief just a few moments ago tweeted out that they are setting up protections against this blaze and we'll have much more on this story as it uh, happens during the six o'clock newscast and tonight at 11. Leanne, okay. Mike? Of course, thank you so much for that. Dan Burt reporting live for us tonight. Now let's go to meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. She has been watching this very closely. So Joe, what's the situation out there? How is this going to, how do you foresee this developing? So winds have been a big part of this story, along with lightning strikes. Over the past 48 hours, we have had hundreds of lightning strikes that have sparked up uh, 97 new fires across the province. Most of these lightning strikes last night. Again, it has not been confirmed the cause of this new fire, but lightning last night is a strong possibility. I want to take you to the map because a front has just passed through the region. It didn't have any lightning or rain with it, but it had very gusty winds. So you can see I put the fire just to the east of Penticton. I've set the satellite and radar back 12 hours. Winds were gusting from the south southeast all the way up until about 2 p.m. Then they picked up to about 30 to 40 kilometers per hour and I think that's what really exploded that fire. Uh, winds have now shifted behind that front just in the past hour so that shifting is causing some erratic fire behavior. Uh, I have a, a, a spotter on the ground who is actually a fire specialist and he says uh, the fires are starting to spot across a uh, Highway 33 and heading up a steep but dry plain. So watching the story very closely, of course, as those winds have shifted and that same front sparking up a fire just south of the border, south of Osoyoos. We're watching that closely because it is growing quickly and headed towards the uh, Canadian border. So a very active night. You can see this big picture. This is the live lightning detector and things are still firing up in places where fire danger is high to extreme right now. And we are not talking about any rain in the forecast until Thursday. So it is going to be a very active, uh, unfortunately, next 24 hours. All right, Joe, thanks very much. Talk to you again in a bit. The weather update is brought to you by Fortis BC. Using more energy these days, we've got energy saving tips, easy upgrades, how-to videos, and more. The biggest school district in our province is revealing what classes will look like when secondary school students return next month. There will be a hybrid model of online and in-class learning in Surrey, and start times and breaks will be staggered to avoid students clustering. As Jesse Johnston reports, some aspects of the plan still have parents and teachers concerned. Classes won't look anything like they did at this time last year in Surrey. Secondary students will be broken up into learning groups of either 30 or 60, which is well below the province's guideline of 120. The Surrey Teachers Association applauds the district for going above and beyond what's required, but there are still concerns about having dozens of children in classrooms that aren't big enough for physical distancing. We're hearing from a lot of teachers. We did a survey of teachers and high numbers of them report feeling either highly anxious or anxious about how safe it will be going back. So there's a very high level of concern and that's because they know what the reality is in their classroom and how densely packed they are. Students will take two courses at a time for 10 weeks, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. There will be a mix of online and in-class learning, which was one of the main questions parents have had going into the school year. It wasn't very clear, so we had a lot of parents panicking. And wouldn't you know it, our district is doing exactly that. They're accommodating our students uh, with remote class and as well as in class um, time in the schools. 
To avoid crowding, lunch times, start times, and break times will all be staggered. Students will be required to wear masks in high traffic areas like hallways, and there will be moving lines and directions, like you see at stores. The Surrey TA appreciates those measures, but still, questions remain about what will happen inside the classroom. I can't think of any other place where we would feel comfortable having that many people crunched into such a small space. I think that was going to be safe for everyone. The province still has to sign off on Surrey's plan. The district is expected to release its plan for elementary students in the near future. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Surrey. And another record-setting day in BC's pandemic response as active cases are up now to 775. BC is announcing 83 new cases. And there are now more than 2,300 people self-isolating following exposures. The good news, no new deaths in the past 24 hours, so BC's total remains the same. The number of hospitalizations has risen slightly to six. There are still three patients in intensive care. Now that surge in cases is a big concern for health officials, with the province moving to once again extend its state of emergency. As Briar Stewart tells us, health authorities are now scrambling to stay on top of a new cluster and avoid new lockdowns. It doesn't open till 12. Even before the testing centre opened, cars trying to be among the first in line. Yeah, you can't stop though, you gotta keep moving. And when it opened, it didn't take long. People were told to come back later. Bring us back at 1.30, thank you. Over the weekend, more than 10,000 people were tested in BC and the province now has its highest count ever for active COVID-19 infections. I don't think we expected quite this rate of growth and this sustained. This epidemiologist says even admitted. though hospitalizations are down, the increase in cases is concerning. I think it's a risk if we allow a large burden of cases to build up in the population uh, in young people. They won't stay in young people forever. Eventually, somebody knows somebody. A few bars have been closed after being connected to COVID cases and public health has stepped up inspections of banquet halls. While officials say most businesses are complying with the rules, stronger enforcement is on the way to deal with those letting their guard down. You know, being in that age group that the cases are growing, um, I firsthand know like how uh, people are responding and I don't really think it's, you know, they're not being smart about it, they're not being safe about it. And the timing is particularly worrying for parents given that school is starting soon. I would say unsafe for my family. Edmund Luke launched a petition urging the government to make in-person classes voluntary and asking for online education. More than 35,000 have signed on. The start of the school is right after a long weekend, and many of the cases now that you see are also a product, a result of the long weekend in August. So the question remains, how busy will these testing lineups be come September? Thank you, keep moving. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. And according to Johns Hopkins University in the U.S., the global total of confirmed coronavirus cases is now almost at 22 million. Almost 776,000 people have died from COVID-19, while 13.9 million have recovered. Here's a look at what's happening with the deadly virus around the world. Health officials in South Korea say they've found 457 COVID cases linked to a huge church in Seoul. It's led by a bitter critic of the country's president, driving an alarming surge of infections in the greater capital area. Australia recorded its lowest one-day rise in new infections in a month today. It's believed a strict lockdown in the country's second most populous state has prevented a fresh wave of cases nationally. New Zealand is ruling out the possibility that a coronavirus outbreak in its biggest city, Auckland, came from frozen food items or freight country reporting 13 new cases today. India is reporting more than 55,000 new cases Tuesday, putting its total virus caseload past 2.7 million. India has the third most cases behind the United States and Brazil. It also has the fourth most deaths. Venezuela's rate of infection of COVID-19 is set to overwhelm its testing capacity, likely leading to an artificial flattening of the contagion curve. Venezuela has registered almost 34,000 cases and 281 deaths. The French government plans to make wearing a mask compulsory in the vast majority of workplaces from September 1st to try to stop a resurgence of the pandemic. 
South Africa, which had one of the world's strictest anti-coronavirus lockdowns for five months, relaxed its restrictions today. It's now allowing sales of alcohol and cigarettes in response to a decreasing number of cases and hospitalizations. Closer to home, Washington State reporting 576 new cases and 15 deaths over the weekend. The state's total number of cases is now at more than 67,000 compared to almost 4,600 here in B.C. And next door in Alberta, 89 new cases are being reported today and one new death. The Edmonton zone now accounts for more than half the COVID-19 cases in that province. And as we inch closer to back to school, many parents are wondering how they can get their kids tested if they develop symptoms of COVID-19. The information is supposed to be simple and straightforward, but as Tina Lovegreen reports tonight, some parents seem to be getting conflicting instructions. Do you have a fever today? No. No. But on Monday, five-year-old Sasa did have a fever and a cough. So they called HealthLink BC to see how she could get tested for COVID-19. Yeah. We got a call back about four hours later. Um, and then they said, yes, you need to go for a test. However, because she's of her age, that she needs to see a pediatrician. And that in Penticton, there's only one clinic doing it, and they're only doing it half days. That means waiting several days for a test and no daycare for Sasa. They require a negative test result. So we could be looking at a five-day turnaround for a, for a pre-K to K age student or age kid to get a test. CBC News reached out to Interior Health. It says there is no requirement that children of any age see a pediatrician for assessment before testing. Any testing location can test kids. Um, and so you don't need to see a pediatrician. You don't need to see your family doctor for that. It's basically just going to the testing site and then finding out if you are positive or negative. That's separate than if you think your child is sick. Um, with disease that needs to see a doctor or a pediatrician or an emergency room. But getting kids tested may be challenging in other ways. Holding down a four or five year old to get a swab in their nose may require some explanations up front. But from our experience, most kids, if you explain why they're doing it, um, then they typically tolerate it. Most kids know what's happening in the world right now and understand why they're being tested. And to help parents, BC Children's Hospital created this video. You probably know there's a virus going around right now called COVID-19. To make it easier to explain the problem process and get kids comfortable. You might sit on your mom or dad's lap, unless you're a big kid. As for Lee and his daughter. Do you want to be back in daycare? Yeah. Do you miss Annika? Yeah. Confusing right. instructions, <laughs> keeping Sasa away from her friends. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. The First Nations Leadership Council is calling on the federal government to issue an emergency order to close all sockeye salmon fisheries on the Fraser River, citing a catastrophic decline in stocks of the fish. The council says about 280,000 salmon are set to return this year. That's down from over a million 10 years ago. It says some of the reasons for the rapid decline include climate change, open net pen fish farming, and the big bar landslide, which has made it hard for sockeye to return to their spawning grounds. The council says salmon are integral because they provide food to remote communities. It also says it's been asking Ottawa to save stocks for decades and that it's time for jurisdiction over salmon to be transferred back to First Nations. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada was not available for comment today. Ontario Provincial Police are now investigating actions taken by top RCMP brass following Robert Jukanski's death in 2007. Chikansky died after being tasered by RCMP officers at YVR. After a lengthy investigation, two of those officers were found guilty of perjury. Two were acquitted. The officers claimed they were scapegoated by RCMP brass and that senior RCMP members withheld key documents and failed to support them. Now Ontario Provincial Police are investigating whether actions by top RCMP brass amounts to criminal activity. There's no timeline on when the OPP will present its findings. Organizers of the PNE say the future of the fair is at risk without emergency federal funding. 
Because the fare is owned by the City of Vancouver, municipalities are not eligible for the Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy. Normally, the PNE sees nearly $60 million in revenue, but this year they're looking at only $8 million. According to President Shelley Frost, the loss is devastating. The union of 4,000 employees has started an online Save the PNE campaign and is asking supporters to sign on. One of our province's most distinguished Indigenous leaders, Dr. Joe Gosnell, has died. Vanishka Lissom's government in northwestern B.C. says Gosnell died this morning at his home. He was the president of the Niska Nation when he signed the country's first modern treaty with the federal and provincial governments back in the year 2000. He was an officer and a companion of the Order of Canada and a former chancellor of the University of Northern B.C. Gosnell had been battling cancer. He was 84 years old. Quite the man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, a reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You can also follow both of us and Johanna on Instagram and Twitter as well. Well, this week we are profiling the final four neighborhoods in our summer-long search for the best one in Metro Vancouver. Yesterday we brought you Mount Pleasant, the best neighborhood in Vancouver. And today Justin McElroy looks at the finalists from the south of the Fraser. It's one with a longer history than pretty much any other neighborhood in the region. Even the most modern and trendy of industries in Fort Langley pays homage to the area's history. Just made sense obviously with Fort Langley and, and the history that's here. Everyone here knows about the fort, built by the Hudson's Bay Company as the first European settlement in the Lower Mainland. But 170 years later, it's the tree-lined streets and mix of small businesses that make it livable for locals. It's just a, a really unique place that kind of, when, you, when you're here and you're through it, you don't feel like you're in the Lower Mainland. Yeah, you kind of feel like you're somewhere a little bit more remote. It's easy to see why Fort Langley is so appealing. At a time when so much of Metro Vancouver is growing, the neighborhood stands in for Riverdale and other Anytown USA streets on film sets with its heritage vibe. You get beauty, uh, you get history, you get to visit the historic site and the museum and you have the Fort to Fort Trail and you have so many beautiful uh, stores and restaurants. Jasmine Marjanovic moved here 28 years ago after falling in love with the town during a school field trip to the fort. She says keeping that heritage feel doesn't happen by accident. I think it's the people that um, really believe in Fort Langley, that love Fort Langley, that keep it Fort Langley. And they really try to uh, not change it too, too much. And I think that's part of the beauty and the attraction of it. Whether that stays the same forever is unknown, but it will always be a place with a fort and with a heart. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Fort Langley. And I think we can all agree they're both very, very unique and have uh, their own uh, fantastic qualities. Yes, Fort Langley versus Mount Pleasant. I don't Checking get to... the voting? Uh, yes, so apparently we've been told by our control, control room that Mount Pleasant is just edging out Fort Langley right now, 47 to 43 percent. Or is it 53? 50, no, I think it's 47 to 40. 53-47. Sorry, bad math. <laughs> Oof, what was that? That's okay. Well, I'm a we'll get it all sorted out. And we can just edit out that part later. Yeah. yeah. I never said it. <laughs> a spike in COVID-19 cases has Alberta officials worried. Why is Edmonton the hotspot? We'll tell you after the break.
The city of Edmonton now accounts for more than half of Alberta's active cases. It's a spike that has health officials there very concerned. As Carolyn Dunn reports, they're pointing to large gatherings as the main reason for the spread. For the Rana Bass family, the carefree days of summer have been plagued by uncertainty about returning to school. In the end, Mackenzie and Ashan will put on their masks and head back. If we just don't feel safe within a couple months of school starting, we definitely have that option to say, hey, I think we just might rethink this and keep the kids home. Teachers and school staff are being encouraged to be tested before classes begin. Here's what they were facing today. A snaking lineup of people waiting to be tested for COVID-19, perhaps the most visible sign that Edmonton is seeing a big spike. Just nine days after returning to work in hotel maintenance, Gary Sander is off yet again. A co-worker has tested positive. His income has been halved, but Sander has a bigger concern. Oh, well, I could take it home to my family, and I don't want my family to get it because my wife is diabetic, so we can't take the risk. Most of Edmonton's cases have come from parties and social events, a vast majority of new cases in people under 40. But there are now 15 confirmed Edmonton cases connected to this church, raising concerns about other gatherings. Enough cases to put the city on an official COVID watch. There are no additional public health measures required at this time in Edmonton. However, we are watching it closely. This infectious diseases specialist says the numbers are a clear warning sign. And as soon as you let your guard down, it seems to come roaring back very effectively. And I think we're seeing the start of that here. The question now is how to convince the rest of the city to take the measures needed to reduce that roar. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Edmonton. Nations that put their own interests ahead of others have made the pandemic worse. That's according to the World Health Organization. It's led to critical shortages of protective gear and battles over distribution of a yet-to-be-proven vaccine. And now the WHO says the misguided self-interest of people under the age of 40 is fueling conditions for a deadly global resurgence of infections. You are not invincible to this virus. We are seeing people, even young people, who are ending up with severe disease. We are seeing young people who are ending up in ICU, and we are seeing young people who are dying from this virus. And it's not just school kids adjusting to new realities in the classroom or out of it. Post-secondary students are also coming up against new challenges, especially as they enter first year. Deanna Simonak-Johnson takes a look at that. Four days from now, this high school grad will leave her parents' home from Montreal to start her first year at McGill University. All of her courses will be taught online, but she has still chosen to live on campus. I know for a fact that I, I'm just really bad at working in my own home, so to be on campus would really be the best thing for me to like, actually focus on my classes. But while she's excited, there are many unknowns. The residence she was initially assigned to was shut down because of its communal bathroom. So I don't actually know where I'm going to be living right now. I probably will be living in upper, a different residence, hotel style. It's all single rooms and they all have their own bathroom. Uncertainty, anxiety, last minute changes, all now part of the package for students who choose to study on campus. Here at the University of Toronto, students are only now finding out some of their courses are going online. The school is reducing the number of in-person courses, saying students will be informed sometime before the school year starts. That's just three weeks away. On the East Coast, four provincial governments established the Atlantic bubble. This is where we cook uh, our three meals a day. Students from outside those provinces have to quarantine for 14 days, like this Montrealer studying in Nova Scotia. Not really allowed to go outside except maybe for a little bit of fresh air. Um, my apartment is on the third floor of the house, so I don't have access to um, a balcony or something like that. But even with all those protocols in place, experts worry that much still depends on individual student behavior. They're, you know, expecting to have the social component of, of life in residence, life away from home. And that's going to be, be hard to navigate during COVID. Hana Mitsui Hot says her parents trust her to be responsible. One hard part will be saying goodbye in the 15 minutes families are allotted to move the student in and leave the campus. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto.
Well, Justin Trudeau is trying to turn the page after a tumultuous few weeks. Today, he appointed Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland as Canada's first federal female finance minister. But as David Conkren reports, the changes aren't softening the attacks from the opposition. The Honourable Christia Freeland. After weeks of controversy, a moment of history. I, Christia Freeland, do solemnly and sincerely promise and swear. With that oath, Christia Freeland becomes the first woman to serve as Canada's federal finance minister. It's a move made necessary by Bill Morneau's abrupt resignation on Monday. I'll be stepping down as finance minister and as member of parliament for Toronto Centre. His exit comes after a week of stories quoting anonymous sources, speaking bluntly about the growing rift between the now former finance minister and the prime minister. A series of articles that made Morneau's departure inevitable and changes to cabinet necessary. Moi, Dominique Leblanc. So the other domino, Dominique Leblanc, who assumes the intergovernmental affairs role formerly held by Freeland. Regardless, though, of how you play musical chairs, we still have the same corrupt and incompetent Prime Minister ahead of the same corrupt and chaotic government. The opposition won't let Trudeau change the conversation. It has been a privilege to work with Bill and I wish him all the very best in the coming years. As easily as he changes his cabinet. So Trudeau is hitting the reset button entirely. Today, I have asked the Governor General to prorogue Parliament proroguing Parliament until September 23rd, when it will return with a new speech from the throne. As much as this pandemic is an unexpected challenge, it is also an unprecedented opportunity. This is our chance to build a more resilient Canada. He promises a blueprint for a post-pandemic Canada that will immediately go to a confidence vote to decide if a government that has just lost a top minister holds on to power or faces an election. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, this is night two of the Democratic National Convention in the U.S., forced online and on TV only over COVID-19 concerns. Our Susan Ormiston is on the ground in Wisconsin tonight, which turned Republican four years ago after three decades of supporting Democrats. <laughs> Cows don't care, but paddocks are political turf in Wisconsin. Kristen Jersick is passionate about climate and sustainable agriculture. She smells a change, well, hopes. I feel like people out here are super frustrated with the agricultural economy itself and with the trade war. I definitely know people that have remorse that they made a bad choice. Outside the cities, Wisconsin is more conservative. Jersik's neighboring farmers went with Donald Trump last time. To win, Joe Biden will need to show up eventually. Hillary Clinton didn't. She just took it for granted that, you know, Wisconsin was a given. Do you think it's going to be close? I do. In this community, so many people are just staunch Republicans. But if Grandpa voted that way, everybody else is going to keep voting that way, maybe without thinking a lot about it. Trump and Pence are here twice this week when the state was supposed to be overrun with Democrats for their convention. There's no mistaking loyalties at Arbach Acres with a flag, F your feelings. The state is in chaos. I <laughs> am um, actually, I am a Trump fan. Um, I know people don't really want to hear that. He pretty much says, this is how I feel, this is what I think. If you don't like it, he doesn't care. But I also think he is more for the people than what people give him credit for. But in the city, places like North End Milwaukee, struggling before or worse with the pandemic, voting here in 2016 fell 20%, helping Trump. Dan says he will vote this time. Trump is a bully, he's, he's ignorant, he don't know nothing. I don't even know how you'd be as president. If Trump could be the president, then you, you might as well vote Kanye for, for president. Too many communities have been left in the lurch. Now, with the virtual convention, with neighbors watching in their backyards instead of the convention floor, that'll test Democrats' ingenuity to energize the vote to bring Wisconsin back in the fold. I think people have now learned their lesson, and they are going to vote in droves. Uh, this fall. Wisconsin's extremely important. 
I think we win Wisconsin and we have uh, President Joe Biden. They say they're ready. Susan Ormiston reporting tonight from Milwaukee. A smaller bubbles, staggered breaks, and even online learning. Details behind Surrey's back to school plan. We're going to speak with Superintendent Jordan Tinney next. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Being in the age group that the cases are growing, um, I firsthand know like how uh, people are responding, and I don't really think it's, you know, they're not being smart about it, they're not being safe about it. BC Premier John Horgan says unsafe parties and large gatherings are eroding the hard work many people are doing to stop the spread of COVID-19. He says the province will be announcing enforcement action against those who continue to put others at risk. The province's state of emergency is being extended to September 1st. BC is reporting 83 new cases today, but no new deaths. If she presents any symptoms, she's not allowed to be at daycare until she has either 14 days of quarantine or a negative COVID test. 
As we head closer to back to school, many parents are wondering how they can get their kids tested if they develop symptoms of COVID-19. But some parents seem to be getting conflicting instructions about where to go. Health officials say children can be tested at any of BC's 87 testing locations. I did a survey of teachers and high numbers of them report feeling either highly anxious or anxious about how safe it will be going back. Teachers in Surrey are very concerned about packing students into small classrooms come the fall. BC's largest school district unveiled its back to school plan for secondary students today. Cohorts will have either 30 or 60 students. The province's cap is 120. Elementary school plans are expected in the near future. Well, students are headed back to school in just a few weeks, but it's teachers and school staff who are facing a tough test right now. How do they deliver quality education and keep kids safe during a pandemic? School districts need to submit their plans to the province by Friday. And for more, we're joined by Jordan Tenney. He's the superintendent of the Surrey School District, BC's largest. So Jordan, thanks for joining us, first of all. Oh, thanks very much for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, so we're getting a sneak peek of what your district's plan is. You're keeping cohorts to 30 to 60 students, but we're still hearing concerns from some teachers that individual classes could be too big. How are you addressing that worry? Well, I think for us going down to basically one single class as a cohort is, is a lot smaller than the 120. Um, so that's our starting point. Um, you know, the, the directions from the Ministry of Education and Dr. Bonnie Henry are that it is the cohort size that is is the thing that we're looking to keep smaller and not the individual class size. So we wouldn't be going down necessarily to, you know, 10 or 15 students. But there are cases where if we have students who cross cohort, where they interact between cohorts, we will go to a much smaller size for those classes. Okay, so if the goal in all of this is social interaction, what happens if a student is in a cohort with a few or none of their friends? Yeah, well, the students, remember, the students can still interact with their peers at break times and at lunch, but when they do go cross cohort, this is the time when they need to practice physical distancing, um, and you saw the new announcement on masks as another piece, but remember, we're talking about the a hierarchy of controls, so there are all the things that we're going to be asking students and staff to do around maintain your physical distance, keep your personal hygiene good, don't come to school when you're sick. Um, and yeah, if you cannot practice social distancing, then masks are another piece. Okay. And, and most students are going to spend half of their time online and then half of them in class. So do we know at this point which classes fall where for your district? No, we wouldn't because now that we've just, uh, you know, we've got our, our structure ready and we're getting ready, as we said, to, to submit to the Ministry of Education on Friday to see if our plan is approved overall. So it's the structure that's in place. And then our principals and vice principals are... Uh, you know, doing amazing work in the background now, spinning the timetables in their school to see which courses actually fall into which blocks and what it actually looks like, both for students and for staff. And the province, as you mentioned, is now requiring masks in high traffic areas, specifically for uh, older students. So how do you enforce that among large student bodies? Is that even possible? Yeah, it's going to be tricky, no doubt. I think, you know, the piece for us um, different from the public is our environments are somewhat controlled and it's your relationship with students where you get to work with them over a period of time and that's different than in the community so there's no question I you know I, I don't make any bones about it it's going to be difficult to police but uh, this is also part of the students learning to be responsible adults and hopefully the older students will will manage their uh, their masks and their distancing and their hygiene and the uh, all of the measures that they have to take well. All right, we'll have to leave it there today. Thank you so much, Superintendent Jordan Tinney with the Surrey School District. Great, thank you very much. Take care. A uh, delivery with a fatal message delivered via crossbow and the amazing story of survival. That's next. And at 6.41 p.m., a live look at the North Shore and out towards the Broad Inlet, beautiful. But it was another hot and muggy one. We could be looking at some of the wet stuff soon, and it can't come soon enough because we are looking at wildfires that are happening across the interior. Johanna will be back with our latest update. Stick around.
when your backyard is burning, is anywhere safe? I'm Adrian Lamb, the host of a new podcast, World on Fire. Join us on the front lines of wildfires burning around the world. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Taking you back to our top story now, hundreds of people have been ordered to leave their property in the Okanagan ahead of a fast-growing wildfire. Some significant updates. Yeah, so we're joined again by uh, Dan Burrett with the latest. Uh, Dan? Yes, this fire has grown fast. BC fire officials now estimate the Christie Mountain wildfire is 250 hectares large and 0% contained. Now, it's burning on the east side of Skaha Lake near Okanagan Falls, just south of Penticton, the regional district ordered people living in 319 properties in Heritage Hills to leave right now. Those properties run from the foot of the lake up the mountainside. You can see it's burning in steep, rocky terrain. It's very tough for those crown crews to get in there. That's why the air tankers have been hitting it from above. We still don't know what sparked this fire. Evacuees are being asked to register at the Emergency Operations Centre, which is at 199 Ellis Street. As we said, it was a hot day in the Okanagan in the low to mid-30s, that fire burning there. Uh, the city of Penticton now says the fire has also forced the closure of the Skaha Bluffs Provincial Park. Again, that Christie Mountain wildfire prompting an evacuation for about 319 properties nearby in Heritage Hills near Skaha Lake, just south of Penticton. You can read more about this story on our website, cbc.ca slash bc, and we will have the latest for you tonight at 11. Leanne, Mike? All right, Dan, thanks very much for the update. Dan Burrett live again tonight with us. And let's bring in meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff again now. You're following uh, this fire there very closely. Obviously, uh, conditions not good. They had all the, the lightning and, uh, and the warm temperatures in that area. And the winds. Unfortunately, yeah, and winds too. Really a perfect combination, unfortunately, of, of extreme fire uh, conditions. Uh, just taking you to the satellite and radar, we had a little front roll through in, the, in just the past couple of hours. Again, still, as Dan mentioned, waiting to find out the cause of that fire, but fresh lightning sparked up over 90 new fires across the province last night. Winds were coming in from the southeast for the better part of the day. And then as that front passed through around 2 p.m., gusting over 30 kilometers per hour. And we've got a fire rule, the 30-30-30 rule. If temps are over 30, winds are over 30 kilometers per hour and relatively relative humidity under 30 percent, that is extreme fire danger. So we had that for a couple of hours this afternoon. Winds have calmed down a little bit, but they're shifting. And as Dan mentioned, uh, difficult terrain is also uh, adding to the situation. Uh, we still want tracking those uh, lightning strikes as they cross over into Alberta. A stable high pressure behind that little front is continuing to lead to high and extreme fire danger across the province for the next 24 hours. We are watching this system very closely that will be bringing some rain to the province and to Vancouver. Uh, let's take you through the forecast. Starting things off with an increasing cloud Wednesday, it will be another mild or warm, I should say, overnight. Yesterday, Temperatures in Vancouver didn't drop below 18 degrees. So yes, that was one of our stickiest nights yet. Uh, increasing cloud tomorrow, but I think the rain will hold off until tomorrow evening. Filling in for Thursday and Friday. This is a pretty big rainmaker for the south coast. Uh, I'll have probably a better idea on rainfall totals tomorrow with the latest models that come in. I'm thinking though this could be an over 50 millimeter story. Uh, then that system will spread across to the interior for Thursday. Doesn't look that, like they'll get as much rain as the south coast, but this could be a game changer for firefighters, especially after another hot and windy day tomorrow. So we'll be watching that system closely. Tomorrow, uh, 30s again in the uh, interior and uh, we'll keep that forecast until Thursday. Notice that nice drop in temperatures as that front rolls through. So not only will we get some rain on Thursday, we'll see those temps drop and relative humidity rise. So Thursday could be a good one as long as we don't see too many lightning strikes. Uh, for us in Metro Vancouver, as I mentioned, another warm one tomorrow, but increasing cloud showers through Thursday and Friday. Temperatures dropping down to the high teens for Thursday. Uh, the weekend not looking too badly, though. This is kind of a perfect lineup. We get our rain and then we get our weekend back. What do you think? That sounds like a great plan, <laughs> and I'm sure fire crews are watching for that Thursday rain very closely. Thanks, Joe. The weather update is brought to you by Fortis BC. Using more energy these days? We've got energy saving tips, easy upgrades, how to videos, and more. 
Well, she lived and is now speaking out. A police allege her former partner hired a hitman to pose as a delivery person and shoot her with a crossbow. Greg Ross has more on her incredible story of survival and the search for the hitman. Not only do I live with constant pain, but I live in constant fear. Fear for my safety and the safety of those around me. Speaking on this police video with her face shaded to protect her identity, the victim of this heinous crime describes the moment she opened the door to a man she thought was a delivery driver. Security video shows the man holding a large box. Little did she know, inside was a loaded crossbow aimed at her. In an instant, I was shot with a crossbow, fighting for my life while on the phone with a 911 operator. I thought I was going to die. The arrow from the crossbow hit her in the center of her torso. Since then, she's undergone multiple surgeries and medical procedures. She says she has permanent physical and psychological damages. To say that this has taken a toll on me physically and emotionally is an understatement. While the man who pulled the trigger is still out there, last week police arrested another man they say was involved. Investigators arrested and have charged Roger Jaggernoth of Mississauga. He is the survivor's ex-common law partner. Detective Sergeant Jim Kettle says police believe Jaggernoth hired someone to kill her. It's clear due to comments made to the survivor by the suspect that this attack was meant to end the survivor's life. The victim doesn't know the man who came to her house that night with a crossbow, but until he's identified and captured by police, she will continue to live in fear. Fear of large crowds, fear of being alone. I even experience anxiety from the sound of a doorbell. Police are offering a $25,000 reward for information that leads to his arrest. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Well, she bought a house, but the mystery came free of charge. Unraveling the story behind a home's stunning artwork, next.
Okay, a woman in St. John's, Newfoundland has a bit of a mystery on her hands, uh, but it turns out she's the perfect person to try to solve it. Mm -hmm. Maureen Power is a museum curator, and the home she just moved into has turned into her latest project. As Katie Breen tells us tonight, it's covered in incredible art, and no one knows for sure who painted it all or even when. There are murals everywhere, in hallways, porches, but the oldest is likely in the living room, discovered by a previous owner. Well, apparently there was a drop ceiling in there. I was talking to the owner who revealed it, and uh, so what he did was he was changing a light picture or something, and he just popped this, the hanging ceiling and you know, flashlight up there and saw this mural. Now it's back on display and beautiful, steadied by some strapping, just in case. So that's the living room one that we know is original to the house. It's got Newfoundland berries, it's got butterflies, it's got a night sky. There's a rope motif and there's the Newfoundland flag going around. Curious about the history of their ceilings, Power posted on a local History Buff Facebook page. That's where she learned it could be the work of Polish inmate Alexander Pindigowski. It was the same uh, artist that did the frescoes at the Basilica and Government House and, um, and uh, the convent that did these. This is Pindagovsky's work at the Colonial Building. He was found guilty of attempting to forge checks in 1880 and sentenced to 15 months at Her Majesty's Penitentiary, back when the building was new. While serving his time, he was let out of jail to paint ceilings at some of the city's more prominent buildings. And when his jail time was up, he advertised his painting services to homeowners in the newspaper, before eventually moving to Boston. It's possible the original owner of Powers House hired Pindagovsky before he left St. John's, but it's not for certain. Well, he left Newfoundland in the 1880s, and I cannot find out if this house was before 1893. Not all of the murals are that old. Power thinks some could have been painted in the early 2000s. Upstairs, there is uh, St. Michael. We believe St. Michael or an angel coming out of the ceiling. And uh, then there's a whole bunch of other paintings and symbols. Power is looking to find out more about these artists, too. And more about the murals that may still be hidden. Because there are more. And so through your move-in process, you actually uncovered one. There was a bit of paint, just like a little bit of paint off on the walls on the way down the stairs. So I got a plastic uh, scraper and started scraping. I revealed another mural. <laughs> While the family chisels away at unpacking, Power is planning her own excavation not just on the stairs, but in rooms where there could possibly be another hidden Pindagovsky. Her hope is to preserve whatever she finds, to figure out the origins and restore the home's history, as her family adds its own chapter to the story. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Wow, what a stunning home. Unbelievable. Yeah. Never know what you're going to find. No. I, I bet you uh, he was a pretty pretty good check forger. Well, maybe not good enough because I guess he got caught, but as an artist <laughs> forging checks, yep. it must have been pretty good. Great handiwork on his yes. part. Mm -hmm. Cool story. All right, so uh, that does it for us for this newscast, but uh, tonight at 11, we are going to have more for you on that uh, Christy Mountain wildfire that is breaking. We've got a reporter out there, and uh, Dan Burt will be back at 11 o'clock with that, along with uh, more stories. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. See you again tomorrow.